All right. Uh, it is Thursday and we are here again, uh, thinking link, pants optional. Um, I don't want to hear your perspective on that, but we're here to have a conversation. Um, it is sports today. Um, we're going to hear a lot about interesting perspectives on sports. We got Ben and Ted, um, and it's going to be a good conversation. I'm certain of that. I want to bring up a note um, before I go into our sponsor for this wonderful weekly event. Um, Kelly Layton is a Division One athlete. She doesn't like me to say that out loud. Every not time I do, sure I know she's like, what, why do you keep saying that? And I you know, it's Division One athlete performance is what we talk about here. That's that's capital. We perform at Division One level. Anyway. Good so. Yeah, good transition. Right, right. Uh, so uh, a moment for our sponsor, um, which would be the team of Capsule. We are a curious crew. We put on these events because we like to learn from others and we like to um, allow other people to share in this <clears throat> and have these conversations and um, be inspired, especially in these times and what we are living through as a, as a culture and as a, as, as a people. Um, we are a special projects team. We work with clients all over the country and some even all over the world, um, large and small. Um, and we do interesting, challenging marketing design and brand related projects. So with that, um, I am going to hand it over to our two guests and have them do their introductions. And I think we could start with Ben and have him give some background and explain why there are helmets in his scene. Um, <laughs> if you don't already know <laughs> what he once did with those helmets. <clears throat> Take it away, Ron. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, the, the fact of the matter is I just stole these helmets uh, from somebody else. You know, they're not even mine. I didn't, I didn't earn these things at all. Um, no, okay, so real quickly, uh, I'm a native of, of South Dakota, uh, played football at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas, and went on to play 10 years in the NFL as a linebacker with the San Diego Chargers, the Minnesota Vikings, and one final year with the St. Louis Rams. Uh, since then, uh, I retired in 2012 and have been involved in sports media so now i am the sideline reporter for the minnesota vikings flagship radio station and i also work college football as a color analyst for fox sports um also westwood one uh, i've done cbs nfl network uh, i've worked kind of across the board uh doing college football work as well so that's kind of my main gig um radio during the year round and and football 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 in the fall well and so uh ben and you can tell ben is currently in the broadcast and i know it sounds obsessive to those of you that have said this before but i'm obsessed by my background or lack of background but as an old broadcast guy i feel it you know i i feel a lot of envy for ben and his beautiful backdrop there <laughs> and, and hats off to all of you who turned on the video for this eight o'clock meeting holy criminy um we encourage so my, video <laughs> yeah right <laughs> well yeah i guess we won't get into the pants is optional um but for the record i am wearing pants i just want that stated i don't want the record to reflect anything different um my name is Ted Johnson. Um, I'm a recovering team executive. I just uh, left the Minnesota Timberwolves organization after 17 years. I started my career in politics, uh, worked in the local, state, national levels, including for this little known governor of Arkansas back in the 90s. Um, came out of politics and went to work at Weber Shandwick where I pitched and won and then eventually ran the, the state's teen anti-smoking campaign called Target Market, which frankly, I think has some relevant lessons for us as we look at racism and, and how, to, um, how, to, how to sort of uh, uh, tackle that systemic sort of attitudinal issue. But uh, that aside, then I was recruited 17 years ago to go work for the Timberwolves. Uh, initially came in to run communications. Within three years, I was a CMO and I ran half the business operations and ended my career there the last five years as the chief strategy officer. And really in that role was responsible for transitioning us from a basketball franchise into a sports and entertainment company. Of course, 
We also run the Minnesota Lynx. Um, but while I was there, in those last five years, I led our effort to renovate Target Center, redevelop Block E, and build our training center. Uh, took our team to China for the global games and some business initiatives and some new ownership. Um, also rebranded the team for the first time in a generation, all four of our franchises. I started our G League franchise. Um, and one of the more interesting projects in my last year with the team, uh, I actually started our esports franchise, T Wolves Gaming, in which we won the national championship in our first year. So I have the distinction of the, of the old, as the only staff person to win five rings, four with the Lynx and one with T Wolves Gaming. Uh, as I exited the door. So happy to join you this morning. Great. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you both. Um, uh, wonderful introductions. Thank you. The, um, I want a little housekeeping things. Questions in the chat at any given point in time, if you have them. Um, we love video on and, and, and then mute on audio so we don't have the background noise of someone's kids or dog coming into the scene. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Kelly for questions. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining, Ben and Ted. Um, I'm gonna dig right in. We were talking about this a little bit before um, the rest of the group jumped on. And um, this, is, this is near and dear to me as a former collegiate athlete. When we think about um, the impact um, of having a balance in sports, um, revenue generating sports versus those that Really, it's, 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 it's a way to elevate the student athlete experience and for, for universities and families, et cetera. Um, I've, I've heard, I'm sure many of us have heard a lot of uh, rumblings, um, specifically a G5 conference that took place um, with uh, Division I athletic departments around the country where they talked about um, you know, the solution to what we're seeing as a pandemic-induced budget cuts across universities and sports. Um, you know, they, there have been discussions around allowing a waiver for conferences and universities um, to, uh, to slash the number of programs they have in their universities and, and still retain, in this case, Division I membership status, um, which again is, is basically a suggestion of, a, of, of cutting our, what we say are tier two sports like volleyball and rowing and soccer and baseball, again, non-revenue generating to a degree um, sports. Curious what both of your perspectives are on the impact. So this is what I, I would personally say is a temporary solution um, to, a, to, a, to a problem we're seeing, but what, what impact do you see long-term in terms of slashing these programs? Again, revenue generating aside, what's your thought? Uh, well, you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, sort of what we're seeing already in the spring, in this last spring semester, where a lot of spring sports, let's say baseball, um, those kids did not get any chance to play collegiately. So what did the NCAA do? They allowed them to have another year of eligibility, which is great. So they don't lose that year of eligibility. The seniors can finally feel like seniors if they want to and get a, a proper send off. But with that being said, what then ends up happening and you're seeing it actually in, in college football recruiting that Without a spring, you don't get a chance to assess where your team is at. And so now you're halting the recruiting process. So it's not just about the effects of what's going to happen this year. This is going to have a, a reverberation that's going to go all the way down the chain into juniors and maybe even sophomore, sophomores in some sports where you, know, you look at hockey and, and kids are getting recruited um, as freshmen, sophomores in high school, even younger than that, basketball, I know that's a revenue, revenue generating sport, but for women's basketball, you know, those, those gals are getting recruited at a very young age to go to colleges. That's all going to be backlogged now. And so now you're, you know, I've heard from college coaches that we need the spring to evaluate who we can bring on and who we're going to, who we're essentially not going to bring back for the fall camp. And then you get preferred walk-ons, you get guys that, that can, uh, that can join the team. So a lot of their recruiting has been halted. Um, kids are struggling as juniors and seniors in high school to find interest from anybody right now, because 
they need to wait till the season starts to figure out where they are uh, with their with their players. And so that's a that's a big thing that that I think is gonna you know it's gonna reverberate for a couple years until things kind of thin out and and spread out a little bit. And then I would say you know being a being a transitioning athlete, even though that I was you know, older, I was a grown adult when I got done playing football, uh, but there's still a, a rough time in, in the year to two when, you, when you're not playing that sport. And, and Kelly, I'm sure that you can kind of attest to kind of this wayward lost feeling, I think, when you're done with collegiate athletics. These kids that are going to lose a year of eligibility and not play their specific sport, I think the mental health thing is not talked about as well. And what's going to happen with these kids when you're told we're not playing your season this year and like, okay, what's the alternative? Well, we're just going to practice. We're just going to practice for a year. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's not, that's a really hard thing to, to overcome. It's a really hard thing to, to go from a high performance athlete into just practice. You lose a sense of purpose and, and who knows what happens down that line. And we've seen, we've heard, um, you know, mental, you know, mental illness and, and the mental side of the game becomes such a big piece of it because it is, and it's never really been talked about. And I worry that you start cutting back on these sports, even if you just put a moratorium on it for one season, what's that going to do to the psyche of these kids that, that, uh, you know, don't have a lot of support system and they need these seasons and they need to feel competitive. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. But, yeah. You know, and, <clears throat> I think it's really interesting to hear Ben your perspective right as a as an athlete I'm I'm more of a business person and I look at you know the, one of the great things about this conversation this morning is is there are no right or wrong answers because the book is being written as we go um, I take a look at the world of professional sports like the hospitality industry I mean it's been completely decimated and it's going to be a long time in sort of coming back just because of the nature of the business. You know, sports and entertainment are built around crowds. Um, And so the interesting thing with collegiate sports, I think, is that there was already, uh, you know, they they were already entering a tumultuous time because there were a lot of other issues at play that they were considering. You know, we have a good friend, Kevin Warren, who used to be the COO of the Vikings, who now is the commissioner of the Big Ten. And he was already wrestling with this. I saw it already come up in the chat, the, the name, likeness, and image, right? Are, are athletes going to be paid or be allowed to have sponsorships? And, and I think there was a sea change occurring uh, in the world of collegiate sports anyways. And so, you know, you just look at the very difficult realities. Reality is, right, there are two or three sports that generate the revenue that support all these other sports and the reality is if they're not playing the revenues are not there to support it now being a higher learning institution i can't imagine them going out and and increasing tuition among students to pay for quasi-professional teams and so i think that is just you know the ncaa facing the harsh reality that the resources are not going to be there but it really calls into question a larger mindset that and change that i think is going on in collegiate sports for a long time They've, from a business perspective, now I'm talking about, uh, they've really chased the professional model and tried to professionalize how they market and sell and monetize the sports. Um, but I think I think that's I think that's changing, right? I think that <clears throat> if you look at it, the two sports that are traditionally considered, and here we have hockey, which is a third sport, but the two traditional large revenue sports in college are basketball and football. And interestingly enough, those are the two sports that traditionally have not had a minor league system for the professional leagues. And so I take a look at basketball, for example, and, you know, the 17 years I was with the NBA, David Stern always had this vision of creating a minor league system. And over time that has shifted, it's adjusted, it's changed. But in reality, over the last five years, that program's accelerated. The league has created the G League. 29 of the 30 NBA franchises now have a minor league team. For the first time, there's a true minor league system. Once that was established over two or three years, the next step 
was finding a way for 18 year olds to come directly into the NBA rather than going through the collegiate circuit. And it was the idea that, to stop the one and done and frankly, to kind of clean up the system, right? Condoleezza Rice and this group had, had done research and trying to figure out how do you clean up some of these collegiate programs? And I'm talking specifically about basketball and these super AAU teams and the pipeline and under, you know, under the table payments. And our league came to the conclusion that frankly, you know, they were going to be unable to police themselves. So we should find a pathway for those very elite basketball players, which is a very small percentage to find a different pathway at 18. And I think there was a growing consensus amongst a lot of athletic directors that those athletes you know, probably should be compensated or be allowed to be compensated, right? They're, they're creating immense amount of revenues for schools, and yet they're putting their bodies at risk, their careers at risk, mm -hmm. uh, without any compensation other than a, a college degree, potentially. So you kind of have all these different things going on that I think is, is going to change a bit of the landscape of collegiate sports and was moving in that direction anyways. This pandemic, I think, may accelerate some of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so we'll see. But I know, for example, in the G League this year, because of the pandemic, they had allowed an exception within the G League to bring a player in at a million dollar uh, at a million dollar uh, salary, whereas most G League salaries are in that 50,000. If you're a two way player, it could be you know hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and now because of the pandemic and, and the pushback and the time that's been allowed the G League's actually going to create a 31st team called a select team, which really is taking the superstars of high school and bringing them in right away into a paid position on a paid select team. And so I think from the NBA perspective in collegiate basketball, it's accelerated a program that has already existed. And I think the lasting impact then is maybe we get back to more of a mindset that it's it's less of a business, it's more focused on the student athlete experience because you're removing that 1% of 1% of superstars that, you know, in the basketball side, the program's built around those one and done 1% 1 of 1%ers as opposed to really looking at, you know, the, the vast majority of those D1 athletes that probably are not going on to professional sports and focus on the collegiate experience, focus on student athlete. And so, you know, that's sort of where I leap to and putting on my strategy hat, looking out a decade, I think that we're going to see more of a transition in mindset and maybe this pandemic is going to accelerate that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. The purity of collegiate sports, however, we can maintain that across you know, multiple sports and it, it, it has quickly become a business and we understand why to a degree, but, but yes, I, I just, again, it would be unfortunate to see programs cut specifically with a short term focus of we need to manage budgets. And that's not to say, how does that impact even title nine? We won't get into that discussion, but how do you balance women's sports, men's sports when you start to, to again, weed through the 16 that are now the required right for division one membership. So anyway, thank you for, for sharing your thoughts. That's uh, something that we'll continue to follow, see how things play out. Aaron. Yeah, I'm, I am curious, and it's not in our list of questions, but the, the growth of, of eSports. Um, uh, I was at a sports bar the first day that we could actually go inside a restaurant and sat there. Um, and I, you know, maybe pass by a, any type of eSports game on television, right? You got the gamers in the corner and then you, watch the game and it was a basketball game going on and uh and i'm watching it and then i'm sitting with the 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 couple that we're having a chat with and after a while i'm like why am i looking at the basketball game still this is really weird it's an esports game but i kept watching it and kept watching it and i'm like i can't believe i'm watching this am i that desperate for sports or actually is it somewhat entertaining and i'm curious what you your perspective on esports just broadly and, I, and it's got to be accelerating i got to think that's definitely happening and, early in the pandemic, I was hearing that, like sports are gone, but esports are gonna grow dramatically. But um, yeah. yeah, starting with Ben, what is your perspective on seeing esports and its growth and what does it mean for real people, <laughs> right? And real sports, not that it's not real sports, but you know what I mean. Well, it, you know, and I, I, so I just did a LinkedIn 
post on this and, and I got my ring in the mail and I thought the, the reaction is I showed the ring around to friends and family, right? The, the reaction was telling, um, you know, if you're over 35, you just scratch your head and go, you know, what the hell is this? I don't understand it, right? If you're under 35 and it was interesting, we built our training center, our esports training center, right in block D on the Skyway level behind this, this glass facade for anyone that's walked across from Target Center uh, from Block E, you've seen it. And it's amazing. And it's the same thing. You know, anyone over that looks over 35, they sit there and they stare at it. And they're looking at the monitors. They're looking around. And the kids walk right up and they zoom right in on the action and they know exactly what's going on or what's happening because, you know, there is an underground uh, revolution happening right under the noses of most people. And most people don't realize it. At least people my age, you know, I'm 50. And, um, and these, these esports followings are starting to challenge the followings of the major leagues. In other words, the League of Legends, which is a uh, video game, they have more fans and followers than Major League Soccer or the NHL or Major League Baseball. And so whenever you sort of gather that sort of number and that kind of following, uh, you have the ability, right, to build a business and monetize. You're talking about millions of fans across the world that, that watch these games. And so you're right, Aaron. I mean, the pandemic has accelerated what was already happening very quietly underneath the surface because of the lack of content. A lot of sports, and Ben, I don't know if you play, if you were doing it, but a ton of athletes actually took to Twitch and signed up and played tournaments and viewership was through the roof. Um, you know, I think that in their world of development, they're at an interesting place, right? They're, they're going through this transition, trying to figure out what's the best way to distribute their content, their, their broadcast rights, so to speak, and are they gonna do it over TV? Up to now, it's been delivered via Twitch, which is a social online network. Um, and marketers of brands have been trying to figure out, they know it's a buzzword, they know that esports is important, they know that for the next 18 to 35 year old category, it's gonna be an important place to be, but most don't understand. So there's a huge education gap, and I just, you know, I was alive and with the Timberwolves as we went through the digital revolution. I look at the same way, we tried to sell digital for three or four years and couldn't sell it, didn't know how to sell it. Our website had crazy eyeballs from all over the world, and yet we, we couldn't sell online inventory. And then there was a bit of a lag time. It just took time to educate both buyers and sellers. And, uh, you know, frankly, in the creation of some standards too, so how you can measure it, whether it be a Nielsen or an Arbitron or something to measure value. But that's all happening, and it's coming, and people will be surprised. The pandemic has absolutely accelerated it. Yeah, Ben, I got to hear your perspective on this. <laughs> uh, well, I'm I'm definitely uh, I'm definitely over that 35 uh, age category. So when it first came out, I said, "What the hell is this?" You know, um, I didn't really understand it. Look, my my young boys, um, they're involved in Fortnite, so maybe not League of Legends, but. I'm sort of I'm sort of understanding just watching them how they consume media and maybe this is just a broader uh, paint stroke but you know they they come they wake up in the morning just like they did this morning and they're not turning on regular TV you know they're turning on YouTube they're turning on other things to stream uh, what is this gamer doing today uh, what, what game is he playing is it is it um, Grand Theft Auto V and previewing that, or is it Fortnite, or is it something else? And and that's just how the younger generation is consuming media in general. And and they're they are in a sense cord cutting because they're not watching standard mainstream channels. And and so that's been a big shift. And it's not just them; it's all of their friends, and it's that whole generation. And then you get into the value of esports, you know specifically talking Fortnite, you know, they do a tremendous job of keeping things fresh. You know, the, the, the graphics are fun. Uh, the things they get to do are fun. Um, you know, having a guy like Travis Scott jump in a, on, a, on a cameo and kind of do this whole event just based on this, this worldwide rapper. My kids don't even really know who Travis Scott is, but they think it's exciting. They get caught up in these waves of energy. 
And, and I think that's what eSports has done really well. Every event that I've seen on TV, if it's on ESPN, uh, I did not go down to the one that was at the Armory, but I heard about it. It's like a party. You know, the, the, the energy is like, it, it is, is palpable. It's fun. You may not understand what's going on on the screen, but the <laughs> commentators are very well versed on, on educating you and keeping the energy level up. So even as a 41 year old, and maybe I don't understand, you know, what the big pull is, I do understand energy and I do understand entertainment. And I think that's a large part of it that can even grab the older generation of like, you will sit there and say, well, what is this? I don't really understand it, but this is kind of fun. There's music, there's, there's, a, there's a great vibe. I can kind of pick it up on what's going on. And, and you can understand why it's competitive, why it's compelling. And, and I, I agree with you, Ted, like this is a, this pandemic has been outstanding for that world. And we have more and more kids at home quarantined and they're connected to their friends via headset. So they are socializing, you know, they are getting that sense of socializing with each other and they're not doing it with just people in their own neighborhood or their own cliques. It's a worldwide thing. I mean, every sport is trying to go global. You know, the NBA probably is more global than any other sport that we have. Uh, Major League Baseball is pretty global, but the NBA has really reached out, especially through China. But think about e-gaming. It's, it is worldwide. It's, it's India. It's China. It's Australia. You know, it's, it's all of Europe. It's the United States. I mean, it is huge. And so whoever can tap into that and, um, and capture that audience, I mean, that's, that's going to be where we're going. And whether you understand it or not, it's, that's kind of the reality. Yeah. You know, and That's Aaron, Aaron, to bring it back to the NCAA, I think people, a lot of people, I think, would be surprised to hear that, you know, this is already esports is a very large club sport um, on campuses and in high schools, and there are now Division three schools that are actually offering scholarships. Concordia, for example, in Minnesota, offers esports scholarships to recruit people, and that's happening more and more frequently around the country and here in, in Minnesota, you know, the high school league is actually looking at these sports and whether or not that becomes a sanctioned sport through the Minnesota State High School League. Uh, and that may be a little ways off, but I mean, that's how pervasive, as, as Ben was talking about, um, it, it is that pervasive in today's sort of society. And it's, it's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's, Watching it is sort of at like watching, um, you know, as I would imagine, maybe the NBA back in the 1940s, right? As it moved from a quasi professional to a professional environment. I mean, it's a really interesting space to be and to watch. It's a bit of the Wild West. Yeah, really fascinating. I mean, yeah, just the fact that you call it a training facility messes with my head completely right because <laughs> what are you trading your thumbs? I don't well, understand, <laughs> but and, I get and, it. <laughs> It is. For, for perspectives, you know, these teams, Ben referenced the uh, rocker tournament, the Call of Duty tournament, the Armory. You know, these esports franchises are, are, are selling for $30 million for a franchise fee. And to give you perspective, when we bought our G League team, a minor league basketball team that's generating $1.5 million in revenue, you know, we paid $10 million for that team. And these esports franchises are selling for $30 million. So, um that's real money. You see, you see a lot of traditional sports owners now owning or having partial ownership. And so that should indicate that yeah. this is a real thing. People see a real future in it. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. great. And before I hand it back to you, Kelly, I want to make sure we put in a plug for Notre Dame football because there's other Notre Dame football fans on this call right now. <laughs> wow. I want to make sure that gets covered. Wherever you, you know, can get some plug for Notre Dame. I mean, yeah, they, they deserve talk. all the attention they can get, right? Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Really, really quick, like mute, a mute Ben, mute yeah, Ben. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eric had a great question. I'm curious about this too. Just staying on this the, in the esport vein and the, the trend. Um, obviously, both of you having a background in broadcasting. How you see that this esports platform impacting tr more traditional media, um, like broad, you know, broadcast TV, radio. It's a great question. And then obviously we have to embrace it and make shifts 
as as we as you know as we see this 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 trend sticking what's your thought on that I mean, what do you what impact does it have on your job <laughs> for the well, future ben well i i hope they don't put the esports leagues in the fall that's all i can say <laughs> you know um yeah, I certainly don't want them to take eyeballs off of football in my industry, but but it is going to be interesting because it is it is an underground sort of niche thing like Ted was talking about. And at what point in time does it burst and become a mainstream sport? And I think that is the thing that we are going to have to plan for. And um, you know, I know Fox Sports has already been looking into it. Um, you know, the the big the big big companies are already saying, all right, well, this is the wave. Where are we going to place it? And you know, I got to be honest with you that, you know, the, the NHL being the, the low hanging fruit of the, of the, of the core sports in America, you know, they could get quickly overtaken if it comes to ratings. You know, if it's, if these esports things are going to be on a channel lineup that is going against in prime time, you know, in the winter, uh, in the spring, you know, there's a good chance the ratings are going to be higher for an esports event than maybe an NHL game or even a primetime NHL game. So I, I already think that the interest is there. And um, and I don't know how we're going to balance that. You know, you can only consume so much, but um, certainly we're going to have to find a way. I think that these these leagues are going to have to find a way, whether it's, um, you know, NHL on on PlayStation or Xbox, uh, it's Madden football, it's NBA 2K, um, you know, we're going to have to bring those along in conjunction during the seasons to kind of keep the interest for that specific sport. You know, you get the League of Legends, you get Fortnite, which are first person shooter games that have no assimilation to any sports. If those take over, which they which they probably will, I think you're going to miss out if you're looking at if you're if you're in involved in one of those said associations like the NFL or NBA or NHL. Um, you need to capitalize on that. You need to capitalize on your sport with your uh, with your team to bring them to the forefront. And if not, I think everybody's going to get left in the dust. Yep. Great point. Well, and I and I think you know in Ben's world, Ben really hit it well when he described the energy and the engagement, right? And this is what brands are constantly evolving to find new ways to engage, right, with consumers. And sports does it really, really well. Um, I think, you know, and, and forever, there's been this conversation in the broadcast world about how do you change that broadcast experience, right? How do you make it more sticky? How do you, or even in venue, right? What is the role of technology as you're sitting there watching a game? And I think it's it's going to change, you know, how we present the games. And, and you know, what Ben does in his job may be changing and he may be taking lessons eventually from the esports world of, you know, how do you engage this new wave of fans that are coming up that experience it differently or ex have different expectations? And, you know, I'll give you one very simple example from NBA 2K, right? So NBA 2K is the video game that that uh, is about basketball, and, and that's the team that we had. And they experimented, and it's and it's very much a consumer-driven environment. It's, it's very much a grassroots environment, the esports. So you're watching it in NBA two game and they're showing the traditional high camera shot of the game action going left to right, right to left. And all the fans get on to uh, the chat during the game because that's what happens on Twitch. It's kind of a combination of YouTube and Twitter. And they start talking about wanting a different viewpoint because it's hard to follow the action and they're used to playing it from an end zone view. So the great thing about esports. They react very quickly. They put that angle up. The fans love it. And they fundamentally change the way that you view the esports action on the broadcast. Well, the, the response, because of that, the broadcasters actually took a look at that during summer meetings and decided to bring some of it over to the traditional NBA television broadcast. And so what wow. you saw this year was actually experimentation. And most people may not realize the origins of it, but they started to see a end, uh, end to end sort of view camera view that traditionally you would never see in a, a basketball broadcast game or in a, in a, a basketball game broadcast. Uh, but they were experimenting and showing these different angles that frankly have been tested out and have been driven from the esports viewing experience. So 
you know, there will be a convergence here, as you learn, because all these esports fans, when we talk about them as teenagers, because Ben, I also have a 17 year old son, right? Just obsessed with esports and video games, but it bleeds up into 20 and 30 year olds that are, that are playing obsessively and playing these games. So um, when you talk about that 18 to 35 strata, you know, and male, heavily male, you know, this is the way they're looking to engage a lot of those practices. I think you'll see merge over to the traditional sort of linear broadcast. Um, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah, that is fascinating. Um, <clears throat> so not that we can't continue on esports because we could probably do an entire episode on just esports because it is such a fascinating development. Um, uh, Ted, I want to go back to the to the Timberwolves. Um, I've been able to see behind the scenes and the orchestrated experience you put together there um, that is absolutely amazing. Uh, it's hard to really see it as you're experiencing it as a fan as to what happens behind the scenes and how things are the cadence of everything. Um, and you were responsible for a lot of that effort and, and, and upping that experience around the game. Just give me some some tips, some tidbits, some little nuggets of how that all came about and, um, and what you saw from that designed experience. Yeah, so this is, you know, it's, it's a growing focus in the world of sports on the business side. Um, you know, is, is we're, we're constantly faced with the challenge with a sports brand, right? There's so many, there's so much of your brand that is defined by elements you can't control. You know, unlike a packaged good where you can control the packaging, the flavor, the taste, the texture, even where it's placed on the store shelves to a certain degree. You know, in the world of sports, your brand is defined by, you know, 15 to 20 human beings. You know, it could be your owner, your coach, your players. They're constantly in the media. They're winning games or losing games. They're saying things. They're saying brilliant things. They're saying stupid things. And so... You know, you're in this world where you're trying to manage a brand that's that's nearly impossible to, to manage, right? It's like herding cats. And so you're constantly in the business of trying to figure out, um, you know, like any lifestyle brand, how do you make that emotional connection so you're not, your brand isn't being driven by the rational benefits of wins and losses. It has to be more meaningful, right? And there are certain cities and brands that do really well, particularly blue collar cities that have these deep, deep roots, win or lose, you're going to be a, you know, a Mets fan or a Cubbies fan. You know, we don't have that here in the Midwest. We're very much more of a bandwagon town because we have a, we have a whole host of options. And um, other than the Vikings, I mean, the Vikings, we really are a Vikings town, but then below that, I mean, there's a constant battle. So the, the experience has, has become a major focus and that in-game experience has increasingly become a focus of all the businesses of how do you orchestrate something that's interesting and compelling and makes an event beyond the wins and losses, right? And so if you think back to some of your memories of coming to maybe a Timberwolves game or, or something else, you know, we want you to remember that you were there with your grandfather or you did this, you know, you're not going to remember the score of the game. You want to remember the experience of being at the game. So we focus a lot about that. And, and most fans coming in the door, of course, think they walk in the door and they watch a game on the floor between, you know, six and six or 15 and 15 individuals playing basketball. But behind the scenes, you're right. It's really one Timberwolves game is made up of literally hundreds of micro events that are all occurring at the same time and all being coordinated in some fashion. On any given night, there's 10 to 15 sort of large groups of hundreds, if not thousands. There's hundreds of groups of small groups of people. There's pre-game events, post-game events. And so, you know, on a game night, our staff of 200 business people swells up to 1,000 people, all very carefully orchestrating a cacophony of hundreds of events throughout the building and with our training center next door between two blocks. Um, and we're trying to serve up a memorable lifetime experience for every one of those consumers to the best we can. For the average consumer coming through the door, it might be just simply trying to, to focus on your, 
you know, the, the, the drive in, the parking, the get to the ticket, get through quick, have great food service, entertainment on the court with, you know, uh, halftime entertainment and quarter break entertainment and what we're doing in the community and so on and so forth. But then for many, many other subgroups, we're actually going and taking that extra mile and there may be tours and there may be pregame events and postgame events and come down and cut the court or get a photo on the, on the, uh, on the court. So it's a lot of our time and energy is frankly focused. You know, we leave it to the athletes and the coaches to figure out how to put on the game and make that a compelling and entertaining and competitive sort of environment. But we put the business people put our time into making sure that when you walk away from the game, you may not ever remember the score, but you are going to remember that experience and it'll be meaningful and you'll want to engage and come back and, and do more business with, with the team. Ben, you were obviously inside the ropes. Um, but you probably during, I'm guessing during, being an athlete, you had to block a lot of that stuff out and focus on what your job was on the field. But curious, now that you're outside of that, what you see in that orchestrated experience, how much of it you see and and, and how much of it is intriguing to you for how they put on an, an event like that, football game. Well, yeah, I think, you know, the Vikings actually won some awards for their pregame pageantry, um, for lack of a better term. I mean, they, they really put a lot of emphasis on giving people an experience of, okay, we understand that this is a, a high value ticket. Uh, you're spending a lot of time and money with us. So how can we give you something that's more than just the game? And, and that's sort of like what, what Ted was talking about with just how do you get to and from the game? But then when you get to the stadium and they open the doors at 10 o'clock for a noon game, what can you experience? You have to, you know, really look at that from a, from a consumer, like what would I want? What is fun? Do we have live entertainment outside? Uh, do we have live entertainment inside? You have, you know, you got to have great food and beverages and all that stuff. You know, you know clearly the concourses at the new stadium were, were deliberately wider to give people a more open experience and free flowing experience. So you think about all those things and then, you know, up until I think the Carolina Panthers set their field on fire, you could actually, you could actually have live fire come out of the dragon's mouth. And, and, you know, they had to do away with that, but that was a really cool experience. I know people really got into that. Um, you know, the skull chant is another one that they adopted from the, the Icelandic soccer team. That's been a, a huge hit and, and really gone across the whole nation as far as fans go. Uh, those little, those little details, I think, pull you in as a fan and make you proud to wear that logo, make you proud to buy that shirt or that, or that hat and wear it even outside of the football season. And I think the other thing from a player standpoint, um, you know, it's, I, I hate to say this, but you know, you sort of, you, you hate to be taken out of your mental element on, on the day of the game to interact with fans you know, you really do try hard, like you're saying, to kind of block out a lot of that noise and not have that distraction. Um, I think that's one area where the NFL could get better and players need to get better. And, you know, maybe take a little bit from what Major League Baseball does with batting practice and take a little bit what the NBA does. I think more better than anybody else is that connection from the athlete to the fan. You know, the, the thing about an NBA game that the NFL probably needs to look at is, you're right there courtside. Now, I know that you can't, from a fan safety standpoint, the players be right on the field. But, uh, you know, for example, we went to – I took my kids to a game. Uh, I think it was against the Utah Jazz. And, uh, and Donovan Mitchell, who we don't even really know, and I, I'm not even a huge fan of him and I don't really know him, um, you know, came over and, you know, dapped up my kids. And all of a sudden my kids were like – that personal connection of dapping up my kids um, – you know, it was after halftime, he threw the ball to him so he could throw the ball to him to, to outlet pass it so he could shoot it. Like that little thing right there, my kids were so ecstatic. Like they want to know who this player was, what he was all about. And that was a five second interaction, that personal connection. And I think the NFL needs to do a better job of that. You know, you, you see, you know, Stefan Diggs was, he was really good at it. Um, as far as interacting with the fans, playing catch with, with kids before the game, um, but a lot of players don't want to do that. You know, a lot of players just want to stay in their lane, get ready for the game. And if we could somehow massage it into the players, you know, especially from college on the way up, 
to where they build this foundation of like game day is not just about you game day is about the fans as well and yes you've got to go out there and perform at a high level but before the ball's kicked off let's bring this element of of personalizing the experience for the fans i don't know how you do that i think colleges do that really well with you know um I mean, Kelly, maybe even Georgia does this. I don't know. But oh, my the, gosh. The, 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 you know, where the players, the players come through the stands. You know, yeah. that's a really kind of fun experience for the fans. And and uh, I, the NFL seems to be so um, focused on keeping their players separated. I think there's got to be a better way where we can ensure the safety, but also allow people to, to feel and touch the players. And yeah. – that little personal connection can mean you've got a life, a lifelong fan, especially if it's a fan that or a player that you've already sort of adored from afar. And all of a sudden you get to high five that player or, you know, they hand you a pair of gloves that that little kid or that, that fan is now sold for the rest of their life. Like this is the team and this is the player and this is who I want to cheer for. Absolutely. That's a, great That's, point. That's a good point with football. How do you do that? It's a difficult, it's a difficult endeavor, but, but yeah, yeah. It's a big impact. Um, thank you. I, I'm going to jump, Ted, did you have something to add? Well, I, I just saw a note, you know, that, that came in about the, you know, the Minnesota United. I, the one last thing I'd layer on to, um, you know, again, it's, it's really great to have the perspective, right, of an athlete in the business side, both very different perspectives, right, but working within the same organization. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is that, um, you know, Sports, when, when I started 17 years ago, I would say on the business side, it was not a very sophisticated business. You know, my, my quick handicap, right, is these were still ma and pa operations um, in the NBA, for example. And then you had Showtime and the Celtics and tons of money was coming in. Michael Jordan, money was pouring in. Yet they were still kind of being run by ma and pa, small operations of 20, 30 people. And as this money came in, there was a real effort through the 90s, 2000s to professionalize the business side of sports. So when I came in 17 years ago, I'd say a lot of the business practices were far behind most industries. And we've really leapfrogged because there's a concerted effort. I think sports really has, has leapfrogged quite a bit and become bleeding edge on a lot of fronts, particularly around engagement. And so, Aaron, to your point in this question about the United is, you know, these experiences experiences are very purposefully crafted. I'll tell you, when, when I was a CMO of the Wolves, I spent a lot of time trying to recreate the soccer experience, right? I went out to Portland and Seattle. I saw what Major League Soccer was doing in this sort of European super fan kind of thing. And, and we tried forever to create the, um, uh, uh, that same environment and, and supported a fan group. And what I came to realize is, is you know, you have to be authentic to your brand. And as Ben talked about that opening for the NFL, it is a beautifully choreographed skull chant, but boy, it is just, you know, and you, you can just tell, right? It feels like the NFL right down to its bones. It is that big pageantry over the top, big arena, big, big thing. Well, you know, what I discovered with the NBA is we're, we're about lifestyle. We're about, connection to art and hip hop and social issues. And, and we're not about the super fan. And so, you know, it's, whereas before, I think we used to just kind of take lessons from everybody and try it. Most of these teams do, they're, they're very sophisticated and they do look at best practices and they are always looking to see if they can evolve it, but they're much smarter about making sure that whatever that entertainment aspect is or the experience is more authentic to their core audience. And so, you know, what Ben described for the Vikings is done very purposely and it's very different than what the twins are going to do to evoke the, you know, apple pie and hot dogs and Americana, right? That's going to be a different sort of experience versus the NBA, which is about bright lights, big city, hip hop, downtown, thumping music, you know, bar before or dinner beforehand downtown. And, and so, you know, those are all done though very purposely where maybe 15 years ago th they weren't. But, but the teams have really evolved and gotten much smarter on, on designing that experience. That's great.
Uh, I want to. I, I have to comment on on Dave's point about roller derby and the fact that that's a <laughs> in in the mix of sports. I didn't expect roller derby to come up in this conversation. I think it's great that it did, and the fact that the proximity to the actual event and you're warned that you could be hit. Um, if that went into football as as a thing, that would definitely create a different kind of experience, right? <laughs> in there, yeah, yeah, you, uh, yeah. Be you can't. It's a little too close. A little too scary. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's, it's definitely the pageantry and the size of football, just the scale of it. Um, it does it does need those micro moments um, and more of them. And and you're right, built into the behavior of you can you can actually have those, and it can be it, not everybody's going to see. It doesn't have to be as grand as the sport is, but to that one fan, that is going to be a lifetime memory and a powerful one. That's some great points. Thanks, Kellen. That was wonderful. Yeah. Kelly, do you have another question? I do, and I don't. We're, we're not going to have time to dig deeply into this, but it's obviously a very relevant topic. And Ted, you've touched on this a little bit about systemic racism and some of the social issues. I really want to take just a quick macro view and get some perspectives from both of you. Um, I mean, I I think we can all say that sports we can see it as a great leveler in our society, right? They provide access to certain parts. Sports can provide access to certain parts of society that some people may know, n never have otherwise. Um, and obviously the diversity we can see in sports. Um, so we're, we're seeing how athletes, leagues, coaches can use their platform to draw attention to and elevate um, and voice a perspective on social issues um, and causes. Uh, I'd love your perspectives, number one, on, on what role you think these individuals, again, athletes, coaches, leagues, can, can do and should play in drawing attention to these issues. And then also just share some examples of, of how these sports figures and actually sports brands are using their platforms to drive awareness. Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I would say I, I, never, I never realized how lucky I was uh, until all the social justice issues came up, how lucky I was to play a sport like football and, <clears throat> and really reflect on what the locker room experience is like. And unlike other sports, you know, if I can be biased, you know, we are truly a melting pot of, in a, in a, in a microcosm of what society is. And yeah, you know, you, you take away the, the, the physical aspects of the guys in the locker room. It really is just a, uh, a collection of socioeconomic, different backgrounds, different races, different religions. And, you know, in an NFL locker room, let's even take a, a college locker room, you know, we have well over a hundred players. And those hundred players, you know, I met guys from all over the country and they would come and they would play at just Kansas State University in the middle of America. So you, you take that and you extrapolate that across the country in football locker rooms. Guys have to get along. They have to learn certain things about, um, you know, tolerance and, and getting to know other people, breaking down stereotypes, breaking down barriers, you know, even feeling it yourself, like, you know, just on, on the sm such a small, minute level, you know, I grew up in Iowa and South Dakota. I mean, I had guys ask me if, if we still had covered wagons. You know, I had guys ask me if we had color TV, you know, and that's, and, you know, I know that we're, we're, you know, that's a very small thing and not even comparable about, about racial injustice and, and, and all that stuff. But it's funny how stereotypes can play such a big role and you don't even realize it until you get in those environments. And it's, and it's all joking aside and just kind of playing around like, hey, man, you even have color TV? I'm like, yeah, dude, we got color TV. Like we're, we, yeah. you know, we're, we are part of society. But um, that's how I think the ignorance can play a part in all of this. Um, and, and so I'm very lucky that I've got a chance to, to hang out with guys from different backgrounds and get to know them. Um, the role of an athlete though, when it comes to awareness, I think can be a very tricky one. Mm -hmm. And I think, look, the bottom line is athletes are taxpaying Americans. So by and large, you have every right to voice any political opinion that you want. But I would say that with a caveat that yes, you have every right to voice your opinion on any hot topic that you want. You pay taxes just like anybody else. Um, you're, you're a member of the society like anybody else. You can do that. But you also have to realize that you have, you have a great platform to make change and you have a great platform 
to do some harm as well. If you are ill-informed and uneducated on a specific topic and you are riding the wave just because you want social likes or whatever, um, you can actually do more harm to a cause if you're not well-educated. And I think a lot of guys get caught up in just like, oh, this is just, I'm just kind of part of this Twitter world and I want to do this on social media. But, you know, and, and Ted, I mean, I, I don't know how much you were paid attention. Obviously, you, you kind of had to with, with the Hong Kong stuff and the China stuff and NBA players and, and NBA owners voicing their opinion about democracy in Hong Kong. And look, I don't know what's going on there, but I do know this. If you don't know what the hell you're talking about, Maybe just stay out of it, you know, and you're going to get yourself in a lot of trouble and have to backpedal and you're going to lose fans. Yeah, you might gain some fans, but you may lose a lot of fans and you may you may actually uh, tarnish your your organization because you just want to seem like I, I'm, I, I want social likes or it seems like a great cause. But if you're not well informed, you can actually do more harm. So you got to be very careful uh, that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And I don't think guys really understand that. You do have a great platform. Like, let's say, um, you know, Pete Freights. He's, he's the Boston College baseball player. He was a college baseball player that, that sniffed the major league, major league level a little bit. Comes down with ALS. They come up with the Ice Bucket Challenge. And all of a sudden now, on a, on a social media platform, they raise $220 million for ALS. That's how you can elevate and use your platform and, and do good. But if you're not educated and well-informed on a topic, I personally think that you should just keep your mouth shut, you know, and, and until something really strikes your heart and you really know what you're talking about, you're, you're going to have, uh, I, I think, more, more crap to deal with than you really realized. Great point. Yeah. I, think, I think, Ben, you, you know, fundamentally makes the best point right is is i think like everything right i mean they have a greater opportunity they have a a, a larger mouthpiece maybe to speak to it but but it's all predicated on the idea that they actually know what they're doing um you know although i think <clears throat> as a general rule sports if you look back as as major forces for integration and change you look at you know, I look at sports and I look at the military as being the two, two of the greatest integrators in our society. And I think that, you know, part of it is because there's zero sum businesses, right? In the military, <clears throat> you kill or be killed. In sports, you win or you lose. There is no, hey, we got 60% of gold, let's celebrate and get a commission check. It's you win or you lose. You kill or you get killed. And so those, that, that business or that I guess if you call the army or the military a business, it drives a mindset, right? That you will do whatever it takes to get the best edge to succeed at what you do. And that means that you'll push limits and do things that maybe the rest of society is unwilling to do. And so I, you know, I look at those two industries or forces, they've been great integrators from Jesse Owens to Jackie Robinson to, you know, whatever. Um, so I think there's a certain tolerance um, for that. And I would also say that I think for, for athletes, you know, if I look back, I, I, I see that, you know, individual athletes tend to have an easier time. I think when Ben's talking about his locker room of a hundred other players, there's a lot of other dynamics that go into their decision-making. Whereas if you're Muhammad Ali, you're Muhammad Ali. If you decide you want to speak up, right, you can do the cost benefit analysis very quickly there's no other, I don't have an owner, I don't have teammates, whatever, whatever. And so whether it be Muhammad Ali or Billy Jean King, and I think the NBA is probably more vocal than the WNBA because along those same lines, they tend to be smaller groups of individuals. Um, and in our leagues, the players have a much more dominant role in the business, right? Because of that intimacy and people knowing faces, our players are much more important to the marketing. They're, they have they're much more empowered in our business model. The players are a bigger factor in our business uh, in the NBA. So they have a lot more power and authority. So again, when they do that cost benefit analysis, they're not as afraid of owners. They're not as afraid of other power dynamics because they are the face of the league and they, they drive business. So 
you know, I think you have a tendency, and there are those outliers like Colin Kaepernick, certainly, and others, but I think that's why you see, particularly on smaller teams or individual athletes, able to step out front further because it's a less complicated formula for them to, uh, to work through. Right. But, of course, the NBA and WNBA have always been on the forefront, and I think there's different tolerances by leagues, too. I mean, there's just a different expectation that NBA players are going to speak out differently than NFL players. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's um, uh, the thing I've heard recently was systemic racism doesn't make economic sense. Um, it just doesn't, yeah, there's no reason it doesn't help you. Um, it doesn't help systems to have that around. Um, so, and then a lot of what you're speaking of that cost benefit analysis of how you're going to address these things and get this out there. Um, it's definitely part of it. Uh, we are getting to the end of our hour and I want to make sure I get a, one important plug in here, even perhaps more than important than the big ND um, is, uh, is St. Jude. And I want Ben to be able to tell us the story of St. Jude and, um, and, and get a plug for that organization into this conversation. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, yeah, Kelly is, is on, my, on my board and you guys at Capsule have been outstanding um, helping out and a great partner for us. Uh, I took over St. Jude's Golf Tournament a couple years ago and, um, you know, we have an, an unbelievable committee and we were raising money for obviously a very needy cause. And, you know, people may know or they don't know that, um, you know, St. Jude, they, they basically take care of all the expenses for the patients. You know, they're the worldwide leader when it comes to childhood cancer and childhood illness, uh, especially dis dis diseases down in Memphis. And if your child is admitted, uh, your family gets free housing, uh, they, get, they get free room and board, and, and your child gets free services to, to help save their lives. And they share information across the world to help save other lives around the world. And, and so, you know, raising money right now is a huge thing for us. And obviously we've had to kind of shift gears a little bit like everybody else to go virtual, um, but people can still donate. Uh, you go to stjude.org slash together MN. It's, a, it's an initiative that we paired up with uh, three other St. Jude events that, ha that got canceled. And so all together, we're trying to continue to raise money for a great cause. Um, you know, we started on Monday. We've got our live uh, online auction with a bunch of auction items. So, so look out for that as far as uh, being pushed through uh, with links and stuff like that on emails and social media channels. But I do want to take the time to thank um, Federated Insurance, Carousel Motor Group, Delta, Candyland, the Minnesota Twins, Bell Bank uh, for, for being, you know, our corporate sponsors, even through the pandemic. So uh, they've been a huge help. So thanks. Yeah. And Ben, thank, thank you. you. You are an example of an athlete, former, current, using a, a platform for, for a good, great cause. So, so thank you. And hi to Amanda from St. Jude, who I know is on our call as well. So but yes, thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm.